Yeah. I mean, we got a That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't make it sound very strategic, like in a good way. Yeah, I think it's a great practice to tell people to see their best, but I am very rarely good about spending the time with the dress. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Connected to show. Thank <laughs> you. 
the video oh, snip, that I have a short video I watched. It was pretty good. It was fun. It was very concise. It's on, it's on their YouTube. Um, I think they tweeted yep. it. I think it's also the Twitter. Um, it's, it's, um, it's um. Yeah, it's like short. And you're looking for a yellow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's, like, it's not a. It's not like just like into a channel. That's like what. Well, it's nice to just walk. It was well done. And they had to have it. Around, goes all around the world, like the golf courses and everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. kind of similar. Yeah. You, right you know, I see. I spotted that on the way. Exactly. Yeah. You would cross right over it, but if you get on that, it just goes right. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's not yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. 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 No, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm not a you know challenge yeah. hiker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Enjoy a nice stroll in the woods. This is exactly what it. Exactly. It's actually where I often. So much. We don't call it the Chinese. The only time then I get it. Yeah, this is like, you know, nasty heat. <laughs> But, but, nice but, but, but you're showing the, the sweat of your brow right. of <laughs> preparation for like class. That. Something like that. I'm serious yeah. about this. I told my students that thing this morning. That's what I don't know. I was a huge fan. I was All right, welcome and good morning. Thank you all for being here. My name is Jacob Charles, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Firearms Law, a newly formed academic center here at Duke Law School. The center seeks to aid the development of the field of firearms law as a scholarly field of inquiry. Throughout the year, the center, with faculty co-directors Daryl Miller and Joseph Boker, aims to elevate the discourse around the Second Amendment and firearms law. We're excited to have a fantastic panel today for a discussion on gun rights and regulation outside the home. I'd like to thank Duke Law School for allowing us to host this symposium here and to the journal Law and Contemporary Problems for undertaking to publish the articles that will be coming out of this symposium. I'd also like to give a special thank you to Allison Rackley, who assists the center. She's right outside and helps make everything go smoothly today. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to our first panel. Uh, thanks a lot, Jake. Um, I'm Joseph Bloker, and uh, before we kick things off on this first panel, I just wanted to um, reciprocate the thanks to Jake, uh, who has been in his role as executive director now for barely six months, and in that time has pulled together symposia, workshops, this conference, um, has been working on his own scholarship, some of which we'll hear about later today, um, is getting ready to teach his first class next semester, has really just had an extraordinary um, extraordinarily productive time on the job. We're very grateful. And also like to echo Jake's uh, thanks to Allison, who actually is there in the back. Um, Allison, thank you so much uh, for making everything come together as smoothly as it has. Um, I'm also grateful to all of you for being here, um, and i um, very, very happy to be serving as moderator on the first panel. Uh, I'm going to be doing that just by briefly introducing our three speakers and then getting out of the way so they can talk about their research, and then I'll kick things off with a few questions and then open up to the audience, so please be preparing uh, questions of your own. Uh, we'll start um, right here to my left um, with Greg McGarrian, who is the Thomas and Carol Green Professor of Law at Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. Uh, after him, Josh Blackman, who is associate professor at South Texas College of Law in Houston. And then um, uh, on the far right, Marianne Franks, who is professor of law and Dean's Distinguished Scholar at the University of Miami School of Law. Start with you, Greg. All right, well, thank you. I, I also want to thank uh, everyone for, all of you for being here and, and everyone who's been uh, involved in getting this event together. Uh, Jake, the editors of Long Contemporary Problems, and especially Joseph and Daryl, who have been uh, my guides and lodestars in thinking about the Second Amendment since before I knew them. I think certainly since before I knew uh, Daryl and who continue to just do amazingly wise work in this field. What I want to talk about today is what I hope and plan will be part of a book project ultimately on the interconnections, relationships, conflicts between First and Second Amendment rights and interests. And 
in some ways, the stuff that I'm talking about today is, is so close to so many themes that interest me that I think I'm having a hard time framing it. So I'm, I, I apologize to all of you. What I'm going to do today a little bit is attempt to reframe on the fly. I'm going to try to explain uh, my ideas here in a way that makes coherent sense in the hope that I can do that. It's not entirely clear that I can. So <laughs> if you feel the need to just let your mind wander, check your phone, whatever, I'm not going to object. Uh, so this, this piece of this larger project is about the ways in which I think uh, Second Amendment claims, gun rights claims more broadly, interfere with or undercut certain kinds of First Amendment speech interests. Um, the, 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 the biggest and most prominent example of this sort of conflict and the one that justifies my <coughs> presenting this work in, in this symposium is what we can shorthand as the Charlottesville problem, the, the problem of, of open carry and public protest and the extent to which those things are compatible or incompatible. But I think there are a number of other uh, uh, types of conflicts that fit into this broader first versus Second Amendment speech versus guns frame. And so the, the main thing that I want to try to do today is talk about those different uh, speech gun conflicts, sort of situate them together, organize them a little bit, and say a little bit about how they uh, play out as matters of doctrine, legal doctrine, or more commonly public policy. Uh, and then in the last part of my talk, I want to tease out a couple of broader themes that I think emerge from these intersections and, and clashes between uh, the First Amendment and Second Amendment type interests. In, in thinking about this stuff as doctrine or public policy, there's an interesting dynamic. The Second Amendment is still emerging, uh, obviously, as legal doctrine. There's a lot we don't know. And so all of these uh, conflicts that I'm going to talk about could change dramatically uh, depending on what the Supreme Court decides to include within the scope of Second Amendment doctrine. The First Amendment, in contrast, uh, is obviously at this point venerable. We know a lot about it. But I think it's always evolving. And, and maybe more, if I'm being more honest, I have to say I hope it keeps evolving because I'm not terribly thrilled about where First Amendment doctrine is at this moment. So my analysis of uh, these conflicts is, is sort of informed by that interesting dynamic between where the First and Second Amendment stand. I should also say that I come to this with a, a, a very strong normative prior. The, the big theme of this book and of my thinking and writing in this area uh, basically boils down to a preference for uh, speech and speech rights versus guns and gun rights to the extent those things are incompatible. So I, don't, I want to be transparent about my biases, but I hope that what I'm going to talk about will, at least in its organization and description, be useful to people who completely disagree with me. So broadly speaking, I think we've seen uh, three, what I'm trying to organize is three different kinds of conflicts between speech interests and uh, gun rights interests. Uh, the first category, broadly speaking, is uh, what I call public discourse versus public carry. The second category is conflicts between uh, sort of public information and public political processes on one side and the uh, effort to secure and uh, develop gun rights on the other side. And then the third broad category is, is conflicting claims about the causes of gun violence. So I want to talk about each of these categories of First and Second Amendment conflicts in turn, and, and the first two contain a couple of different moving parts. So uh, public discourse versus public carry, uh, there are really two types of issues that have emerged that seem to me to fit under this umbrella. The first is the Charlottesville problem, and the second is the issue of uh, concealed carry on campuses and, and statutes that are uh, state statutes that are compelling uh, public universities to allow concealed carry. So the Charlottesville problem is very familiar. Um, uh, open carry and public protests. Uh, gun rights advocates say open carry is uh, a tremendously important right, should be part <clears throat> of what the Second Amendment guarantees. Uh, free speech advocates who are uncomfortable with, with uh, open carry and public protest counter that guns in public protests uh, create or exacerbate volatility and chill speech. A lot has been written about this issue compared particularly to the other things that I'm going to talk about, so I, I don't want to rehash uh, too much. I, I want to focus a little bit on, on the sort of policy debate and, and particularly come at it from the side that I sort of occupy, the side that's more sympathetic to uh, uh, the speech interests and the chilling of speech argument here and less sympathetic to the, the gun rights claim. One uh, approach that people sort of in that camp have, have suggested to uh, deal with 
the problems that they see open carry as presenting for public protest is a sort of zoning approach where uh, certain kinds of public events, public protest, in virtue of their emotional and political volatility, uh, should be sort of gun-free zones. Um, and you can see why that notion would appeal to gun control advocates. As somebody who's both a gun control advocate and uh, an advocate for a certain robust, I think, I hope, vision of free speech, I don't love the zoning idea because I don't love the idea of, of classifying protests as a particular kind of speech. To be very clear, I think public protest is and should be at the core of a robust conception of the First Amendment. I think public protest is probably the most one of the most important things the First Amendment should be protecting. But if you legally define public protest as a particular kind of sphere, I'm afraid that that opens up public protest to greater regulation and vulnerability uh, from all kinds of political forces that want to tamp down public protest. So uh, a more extreme way to go would be just to make this uh, open carry versus public protest problem a, a, a basis for uh, completely rejecting open carry. And, you know, for my money, I'd be comfortable with that, but a lot of people of good will and good conscience wouldn't be. It seems to me that uh, a middle ground approach uh, is, is more promising, and that would be to uh, simply create a, a sort of time, place, and manner idea, or <clears throat> expound a time, place, and manner idea within Second Amendment doctrine that allows law enforcement to uh, limit open carry based on the needs and dictates of particular situations. <clears throat> For anyone who takes the Second Amendment seriously, that approach would require some kind of judicial backstop uh, because law enforcement uh, would otherwise have un unbridled discretion. But I think that discretionary situation-specific approach would be a more promising way of uh, dealing with the difficulties that, that open carry presents for public protest. The other sort of public discourse versus public carry problem uh, deals with public universities. Uh, states like Texas that have legislated a, a requirement that public universities allow uh, concealed carry. There's some ways in which the stakes of this uh, conflict are lower than the public protest context and some ways in which they're higher, particularly on the gun rights side. So the stakes are lower because generally speaking, universities are more subdued settings than public protests. We talk about the importance of robust and, and sometimes uh, uh, sharp discussion in classrooms, and that's certainly true. But generally speaking, uh, the fever pitch doesn't rise to the level that you see in uh, sort of protest and counter-protest in a situation like Charlottesville. So in some ways, the, the, the interests uh, and concerns uh, are the same in the university setting, but dialed down. A couple of big differences, though. Here we're talking about concealed carry rather than open carry. And I think for gun rights advocates, that makes the stakes of the uh, university uh, setting and, and conflict somewhat higher because uh, I take it that concealed carry for more people is, is more likely or more obviously something that should be protected by the Second Amendment than open carry. On the other hand, uh, universities are a much more controlled and regulated space from the outset than public streets and sidewalks where protests take place. And there's a stronger argument, I think, that university administrators should have greater uh, autonomy in, in sort of determining the proper balance between uh, the gun interest and the speech interest. Um, again, I want to do a little bit of a critique of, of what some of my fellow travelers on, in, in this debate have said. One uh, sort of common framing for trying to argue about why universities should not be compelled to allow concealed carry has to do with the conception of academic freedom. And the idea basically that, again, guns chill speech, the no knowledge that guns are in the classroom, even concealed, is going to chill certain people from, from saying things, and that, that what this really comes down to is a problem of academic freedom. The difficulty with that framing is that academic freedom is a remarkably underdeveloped concept in First Amendment law. Everybody believes that the First Amendment protects academic freedom. Most people who care about free speech believe quite fervently that the First Amendment protects academic freedom. But there's very little development in doctrine about what that means, especially when you get into a situation in a public university where the state government is telling the university administration or the university regents or directors what to do. Where the locus of academic freedom sits in that scenario is, is a very difficult thing to uh, uh, tease out, at least given current doctrine and scholarship. So I think it's probably more useful to talk about the 
uh, university concealed carry problem as uh, just a basic free speech versus uh, gun rights scenario. All right, so that's public discourse versus public carry. The, the second uh, ca big category of first, second amendment speech gun conflicts uh, is the one that I'm, I'm having the hardest time framing neatly. And, and the sort of frame that I've got for it right now is the interest in, in uh, securing and expanding gun rights versus the interest in sort of uh, public information and, and the development of public policy. Uh, and in this category, there, there are sort of two different things going on. One has to do with uh, legislative processes uh, and the business of government. So uh, the restrictions on federal research on guns is a public health problem, sort of self-censorship of government to uh, uh, sort of secure space for gun rights not to be interrogated. Uh, certain kinds of uh, state level state laws that preempt local gun legislation. That's obviously something within the power of state governments, but some of these laws go so far as to impose sanctions on individual local legislators or officials who try to promote uh, gun laws. Uh, and then there's sort of extreme uh, collisions of guns and, and legislative processes, the uh, uh, militia that, that sort of uh, occupied or, or descended on the Oregon legislature back in June. Uh, now, here's where you might be saying, I thought you were talking about the First Amendment and free speech. What does any of this have to do with the First Amendment and free speech? It's a fair question. My answer is I think that, for me, the First Amendment is uh, most important for securing space for public political discourse and the development of public policy. And so when <clears throat> gun uh, claims and gun interests uh, sort of stifle legislative processes, stifle government uh, research and inquiry, even stuff like uh, legislative bans on lawsuits against uh, gun manufacturers, which again is well within the power of government, but I think stifles the development of policy in an undesirable way, obviously from the perspective of somebody who uh, is, is sympathetic to gun control, but I think also just from the perspective of, of uh, caring about allowing government to figure out what the best way is to handle important problems of public policy. The, the other type of problem that, that falls under this, uh, this second umbrella, this, this securing gun rights versus public information umbrella, uh, is one that has gotten some uh, play and discussion already, and that's the, some these gun privacy cases. Uh, this is one area where the speech versus guns uh, dynamic has, has emerged as, uh, into litigation. So uh, there have been a couple of cases, Doe versus Putnam County, a New York case where uh, gun owners uh, sued to prevent uh, the uh, local government from turning over uh, uh, names and, and lists of, of gun owners under a public information law. Uh, the other case uh, that's sort of quite similar to Doe is uh, NRA versus Bondi case uh, gun rights challenge where the individual litigants wanted to be able to proceed anonymously. And in both of these cases, uh, the concern was sort of about uh, guns being a stigmatizing, gun ownership and gun advocacy being sort of a stigmatizing uh, uh, factor, and, and so uh, gun owners should be able to keep their identities out of public view. Uh, both of these cases were essentially litigated and argued as, as gun rights, gun privacy cases, but it was gun privacy versus the government's interest in public administration of one kind or another. In both, ca both cases, the gun owners lost. Uh, these cases actually bear a pretty close resemblance to a, a line of cases in First Amendment law, most recently a case called Doe versus Reed, where signatories to California's Proposition 187, the anti-same-sex marriage uh, 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 initiative from several years ago, uh, tried to keep their identity secret on the theory that their expressive activity in signing this anti-same-sex marriage <clears throat> petition would similarly be stigmatizing. And in all of these cases, the speech cases and the gun cases, uh, the courts have been unsympathetic to the privacy claims um, and have basically said the interest in privacy uh, doesn't extend that far. Uh, again, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with the First Amendment or free speech? And again, my response has to do with a, a somewhat broad conception of free speech interests focused on the public's right to information. So the way in which these cases present a sort of conflict or juxtaposition between speech rights and gun rights, in my view, has to do with uh, the interest in, again, what we're sort of seeing as an emerging idea of gun privacy versus the interest in public information. There are good reasons that people might want to know who gun owners are, just as there are good reasons that the public might want to know all kinds of other information within the government's uh, possession. 
There's another gun privacy case that played out differently, and, and differently for an interesting reason. Um, this is a case called Walschlager, an 11th Circuit case uh, that presented a challenge to a state statute that imposed a lot of restrictions on physicians and medical providers uh, related to guns. Uh, you, the physicians weren't allowed to ask about whether the patient had a gun in the home, weren't allowed to talk about the <laughs> ways in which guns might present a public health problem, weren't allowed to maintain certain kinds of records about gun ownership. Uh, physicians challenged this on a First Amendment ground, that, that this uh, law, various aspects of this law, improperly encroached on their expressive autonomy, and uh, they prevailed. And the 11th Circuit, ultimately, in a non-bank uh, decision, struck down this uh, Florida statute. Again, there are interests in play here of gun privacy versus public information, but they play out in a different way because this was a case about a legislative action on behalf of gun rights that implicated individual expressive autonomy, implicated, in other words, an ordinary First Amendment interest rather than these rather broadly conceived First Amendment interests that I'm talking about in the other cases. And with that expressive autonomy interest in plain view, the court found a basis for uh, <clears throat> bringing the clash between gun and speech interests into the open and uh, in this case, holding in, in favor of the speech interest. I want to say more in a couple of minutes about that, diff that sort of uh, difference in, in Walschlager and the importance of the individual autonomy interest and how that plays into this whole discussion. One last big category uh, of uh, gun versus speech conflict, and this one there's less to say about, at least I've found less to say about it so far. And it has to do with uh, just a basic clash on a policy level between speech interests and gun interests, a clash that most often emerges in the wake of mass shootings. Mass shooting happens, uh, gun control advocates say we need more gun restrictions, and a significant segment of the gun rights community responds, no, the problem here is not guns, the problem here is media. The problem here is violent media imagery. And if we're going to do anything to deal with uh, these horrible mass shootings. We shouldn't regulate guns more. We should instead uh, regulate violent video games and violent films. The, the, the political or policy reason for that move is obvious enough. It's, it's a way of, of deflecting attention from uh, a type of regulation that gun rights advocates believe fervently should not be uh, happening, and that's <laughs> further gun regulations. But it's interesting to me that uh, in some contexts, gun rights advocates talk about, oh, you know, the gun, gun rights and speech rights, they go hand in hand. Uh, we're talking about the same kind of interest here. We're all libertarians. But when push comes to shove and when there's at the moments when gun regulation is, is most clearly on the table and, and has a chance of going somewhere, a lot of gun rights advocates immediately jump to, no, let's restrict speech instead. Let's go after the First Amendment right rather than the Second Amendment right. Um, those efforts are, at this point, largely rhetorical, unlikely to succeed. But again, as with all of these types of conflicts, if the Supreme Court uh, expands Second Amendment rights in a way that really does foreclose uh, a lot of the types of regulation that gun control advocates push in the wake of mass shootings, uh, it's entirely plausible that the uh, restrict violent <clears throat> media argument will get uh, at least a more serious hearing in, uh, in public debate. All right, so I've talked through sort of where these, what these conflicts are, where they stand. I, I want to say a little bit now just to, to close about a couple of big themes that I think emerge from these speech versus uh, gun rights conflicts. And this is where part of where my, my effort to frame this stuff has been difficult. And it finally dawned on me that the two themes I want to talk about are, are probably the two themes that I've obsessed about the most in my work uh, up to this point in my career. Uh, public versus private, and stability versus dynamism. So let me say a few words about public versus private first. In these gun speech conflict scenarios, generally speaking, the most potent and frequently uh, rehearsed gun rights arguments are about individual autonomy. I should be able to carry a gun on my person or to carry a gun in this place or to uh, keep and bear arms in this way because I have a right to protect myself and my family. It's, it's a lot of individual autonomy focus. Now, there is a more collectivist argument that sometimes gets aired on behalf of gun rights in these debates. Uh, Joseph and Daryl have helpfully talked about this as the marketplace of violence idea, the notion obviously taken from the First Amendment marketplace of ideas. Uh, it's sort of the good guys with guns idea that, that, that guns in society will create a kind of equilibrium where 
uh, public debate, among other things, can proceed unimpeded because everybody knows that they could be shot if they get out of line and the good guys have guns. Uh, I think the marketplace of violence argument is, is underdeveloped and uh, not terribly persuasive, although I'm certainly, there's a lot more to say about it, and, and uh, perhaps I just haven't been persuaded yet. But generally speaking, on the gun rights side, the arguments are grounded in individual autonomy. In contrast, on the speech side, we have an interesting dynamic. Again, in that Walschlager case, the presence of an individual expressive autonomy interest was the thing that animated, that sort of opened, was the key to the First Amendment kingdom. We can litigate this thing as a First Amendment challenge because there's an individual autonomy interest. But as may have be already become clear by this point, I don't think that's the most important First Amendment free speech interest in these conflicts. I think the much more important interest is uh, the public interest in, receive, in being able to receive information, to engage in public political debate, to direct legislators and government institutions to, uh, re to legislate and regulate in the public will. So if you think of the free speech right in these scenarios more in terms of a collective right to receive information, uh, a collective right to engage in political activity, then the speech side of the conflicts becomes, I think, much more robust and much more important. Uh, and in my view, that is uh, the right way, a better way to think about these problems than courts generally do. So the other dynamic here is one that's, that's sort of a hobby horse of mine, stability versus dynamism. I wrote this book about the Roberts Court's uh, free speech decisions a couple of years ago that was kind of built around this theme. Um, in a lot of debates about how free speech law should take shape, uh, there's ever-present conflict between interests in maintaining social and political stability and enabling social and political dynamism. I think that contrast and that dynamic, that debate, comes through very clearly in these guns versus speech cases. The pro-gun arguments in all of these conflicts generally boil down to safety arguments. We need guns in order to be safe. The world is a threatening place, and self-defense and self-protection is critically important, and guns are... Uh, very effective means of, of self-defense and self-protection. We want to keep the world safe. The speech interests are more generative. They're more creative. They're more about uh, the world is a promising place. Let us see what we can make of the world by discussing it and engaging in, in various kinds of public discourse. Um, I'm a dynamism guy. Uh, in an age where stability is threatened, I'm somewhat swimming against the tide, but, but I, I like a, a regime in which social and political dynamism are enabled and uh, enhanced. I think, again, a robust sort of public-minded uh, conception of, of the First Amendment and free speech principles more broadly promotes <clears throat> that kind of dynamism. And one of the things that, that concerns me about the, the sort of pro-gun rights arguments and all these scenarios I've been talking about is the way in which they seem very grounded in uh, this notion of stability, safety, that I think at its worst can lead to stagnation. So uh, the big takeaway here is that, again, often we hear arguments that First and Second Amendment rights are peas in a pod, that they're compatible, that they resemble each other. And in some ways, that argument is true. But I think it's very important and, and very uh, uh, important in the development of doctrine going forward and theory going forward to focus on the ways in which gun and speech uh, rights claims are very distinct and in many important respects incompatible. Thanks a lot. It's a perfect segue to Josh. Talk about a different intersection of First and Second Amendment. What a rights. perfect segue. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Joseph and Daryl, for having me. Also, I am grateful for balance. Um, it's often the case at Second Amendment conferences that, that everyone's on one side of the debate. And I think in this panel, a, a conscious effort was made to give the other perspective, which I will dutifully provide. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about why the First and Second Amendment work together well. Uh, this is a case that I am very familiar with. Uh, the First Amendment, Second Amendment, and 3D printed guns. <gasps> I can see the, the gas. Um, I have been litigating this issue since 2015, um, and I came to it somewhat reluctantly. Um, in 2014, I wrote a couple of law review articles. One had nothing to do with guns. It argued that data, <clears throat> code, that people develop, will be protected by the First Amendment. Um, the second article was about guns, and it questioned whether the government could prohibit sharing files that can be used to manufacture firearms with a 3D printer. Um, like most scholarship, I doubted it would ever be relevant. Most of our stuff is never read. Um, my stuff got read. 
I got an email out of the blue from Cody Wilson. Uh, Cody, you may know the name, uh, was the first person to develop a 3D printed gun. Uh, he's been called the most dangerous man in the world and all these sort of accolades which he, he loves. Um, he had made headlines for creating the 3D printed gun. But even more than that, he put on the internet, on a site called DefCAD, uh, files <clears throat> that a person could use to manufacture the gun for themselves. Um, that site is no longer up, in part because the State Department sent him a letter. And the State Department said that you are in violation of export control law. That is, by putting a file on the internet, you are engaging in the export of arms. Um, now, I didn't really follow the case after that. He took the site down. Uh, but little I know that Cody actually was building a case to go after the federal government. And he called me and said, I want you to help me with litigation. Now, I didn't really have much experience. I was sort of skeptical, but I was curious. And I learned more. And I said that he actually had a decent case under the First Amendment. Um, there's some administrative stuff here, which I won't bore you with, but uh, there's some other stuff. But I said the First Amendment has some teeth. Uh, so I joined a legal team, uh, Alan Gura, who was the person who argued Heller McDonald was our lead counsel. And we filed a lawsuit in Texas. Uh, preliminary injunction was denied. <clears throat> a divided panel of the Fifth Circuit affirmed. Supreme Court denied cert. OK, sort of what we expected. Uh, but things were looking up. Preliminary injunctions are hard to win. We were going back down for a summary judgment proceeding. We actually were pretty confident. Uh, the Fifth Circuit affirmed on very narrow grounds and seemed to suggest that we may actually prevail when we're on a normal summary judgment standard. Um, on remand, the district court ordered the parties to engage in settlement talks, which is always the case. The judges like settlement. And we actually reached an agreement with the government to settle the case, and I wasn't surprised. I think the government was kind of nervous, given how close the Embank vote was, and given how the composition of the court had changed a bit. Um, we reached a settlement. That's when things got dicey. Uh, in the summer of 2018, last summer, um, we were sued across the country. Uh, long story short, I argued four TROs in five days. Sued in part by one of your funders. Uh, he came after us pretty hard. I beat him. Uh, so again, it's especially grateful that I'm able to be here at a conference where the person I litigate against is paying for my travel. So I, I, uh, I, will, I will enjoy my bagel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love academic freedom. Um, what happened? Uh, on the eve of the settlement, uh, we were sued by a bunch of groups. So several gun control groups, uh, Giffords, uh, Every Town uh, for Gun Violence, the Brady Campaign. Um, they sued us to block the settlement, and they tried to intervene at the last moment. Uh, the judge denied the request, which uh, was right. They had no interest in the settlement. Um, immediately after the judge denied that request, we had our license to put these files online, uh, at which point Cody did. We posted these files online, and they will be online for nearly three or four days uh, over the course of uh, 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 that, that long weekend. Uh, but that was just the first onslaught. Uh, over the next few days, we were sued by the attorneys generals of nearly 20 states. Uh, I, I had to argue in a federal court in Pennsylvania, in a new, a state chancery court in New Jersey. Who knew that you could seek a nationwide injunction in chancery court? Who knew? I don't know. I, I don't think you can do it, but apparently you can. I, I won that one also. But the last one I lost, uh, the Washington attorney general sought a nationwide injunction to block the government from giving us this license. Uh, and a judge in Seattle entered that injunction, and with that, we we lost, and uh, we took the files down. Um, they were online for a good three or four days uh, and been downloaded thousands of times. You can get them anywhere you want. Um, the litigation continues apace. We are now, oh my goodness, in the Third Circuit, in the Fifth Circuit, in the Ninth Circuit. We're basically everywhere at the same time. When you get sued nationwide, the appeals take some time. Uh, eventually, this will, I think, will all filter up to the, to the Supreme Court. Whether they want this case or not, uh, we'll see. Uh, but the litigation continues apace. Uh, my goal today is not to talk about the litigation too much, which I you know is fun. We can talk over lunch about it. But to talk about the issue uh, from a constitutional perspective. Now, let me dispel some myths about what this case is and is not about. Uh, we've never served the right to print the guns. Huh? It's true. We have never once asserted the right to actually print these guns or possess these guns. Um, I freely concede that the state's interest in actually regulating the printing and the possession of the guns um, is different. I have to because of Heller. 
Um, Heller acknowledged that there are longstanding prohibitions on uh, a possession of those who have criminal history and mental illness, and you know, you know the paragraph, right? So given current law, I can't go to court and say that you have a right to print these for anyone uh, if you have a, a criminal background or perhaps uh, you know, a, um, a mental illness, whatever happened, you're disabled for some reason. Okay, so let's get that off the table. <clears throat> Uh, myth number two, um, you can just download a file, click print, and the gun comes out automatically. Uh, this is what most people think. The actual answer is quite different. Uh, it can take up to 40 hours to create a 3D printed gun, an entire week of labor. Um, and it's not as simple as downloading the files. There's a lot of work that a person has to put into the, this process manually. First, you have to what's called slice the code. So if you imagine an, an object in three dimensions, right? This bottle, you know, about a foot tall. Every single layer is a slice. And with each slice, you have to decide how it will be rendered, what materials will be used, the proportions, the dimensions. It's not just point, click, shoot. Um, there's a lot of effort that has to go into it. Um, and even after you print the parts, you have to actually treat the process. For example, you have to put these chemicals on it to withstand the combustion. Uh, the reason why these guns are very hard to make is plastic is a terrible material to make a gun with. It's awful. Why? Metal's good. <clears throat> when metal gets hot, it expands. When metal gets cold, it contracts. It's a very good property for a gun. Plastic's the opposite. When plastic gets hot, it melts. And when it gets cold, it cracks. So if you build a 3D printed gun wrong, you'll probably blow your hand up more likely than shoot someone. Also, there's no rifling, there's no barreling, there's no accuracy. These are awful guns. So myth number three, the overwhelming majority of people who download these files never print them. They don't. Some people do it as an act of rebellion. I think that's most people do it to be, you know, just, just be jerks, right? They, they want to stick it to the man. Uh, a lot of people do it for artistic value. Uh, the, the, the Liberator, the 3D gun code developed, has been displayed in museums. It's been studied by architecture students, interior design students. He's won awards. It's been put in uh, a gallery. So there are a lot of uses for this information beyond actually making the gun. Okay. Um, myth number four, uh, the sort of code we're talking about is indecipherable to a human being. Just It cannot be understood. Uh, uh, therefore, it should not get First Amendment protection. <clears throat> um, if I were to show you the code and give you a five-minute tutorial, you would all understand it. It's fairly straightforward. It's defining shapes in terms of width, length, and height. Um, this is code that really anyone can understand. And the way the software operates, it actually displays it or renders it in three dimensions. The same way you might download a video game uh, and maybe modify it to create a new level, to create a new character. Uh, this technology operates in the same fashion. Um, myth number four. This, this, this is like sort of a, a, a black box that, you know, we can't have these 3D printed guns. Um, the problem is when you try to regulate the files we have, you immediately spill over into regulating other things that you may not be so keen on. So I'll give you an easy example. I gave a lecture on this about a year ago, and a student came up. And she does a lot of this, um, what's called LARPing, right? Uh, live action role playing, where people create these fake weapons uh, to engage in various fantasy games. They actually act out scenes from movies and books and et cetera, whatever. Teach their own, not my thing, right? Um, if you take these laws seriously, it is now a crime in New Jersey to put online code to make a fake gun, right? People 3D print swords. I don't know. They do it. People 3D print rifles. They do it. I don't know. They, you know, they these fake toy rifles for, for movie scenes. Um, these statutes are so necessarily overbroad that they require limiting the production of totally innocuous parts. Okay? Um, in the New Jersey statute, if you take it literally, which, which I do as a First Amendment lawyer, it actually bans the printing of a screw because a screw may be used to, in a firearm. Right? So there's such significant line drawing issues um, uh, uh, with actually trying to prohibit um, these files that I don't know that they can withstand First Amendment scrutiny. Uh, there might be ways, and I actually am open to the idea of maybe you can craft a statute that works. I don't know what it would be, uh, but the current ones in the books now simply don't work. Um, the next myth I want to disabuse you of is that this is actually a problem. Um, there are a lot of guns in America, a lot of guns in America. They're easy to get to. They're cheap. If you are intent on actually harming people, you are not going to spend a week printing a 3D gun that maybe shoots one round and then blows up in your hand. You're not going to do it. 
I argued a case in Washington on this, in Seattle, and the Washington Attorney General, I swear to you, it's in the transcript, said, we are worried about MS-13 smuggling plastic guns over the border to use in acts of narco-terrorism. My goodness, I, I, had to, I almost <laughs> laughed out loud. It, it was so preposterous. Much of the opposition to this is based on fear-mongering, that this is some sort of problem, okay? okay? Myth number six, plastic guns are not new. They're not new. In 1987, I might be off <clears> a year or two, but in the late 1980s, Congress enacted the Undetectable Firearms Act. This law made it a crime to possess a gun with less than a certain quantity of metal. Right? In other words, the gun has to have enough metal that would trigger a magnetometer, a metal detector at an airport, for example. Why was this law in the books in the 1980s? Because plastic guns aren't new. And indeed, I don't think this current technology makes it that much easier to make one. It's a hell of a lot easier to make one at home. Let me tell you how. Go to Home Depot, buy a PVC pipe. You just built a gun. And I'll tell you, the PVC pipe you buy is a hell of a lot stronger than anything that comes out of a 3D printer. So this is largely a problem that doesn't exist. Um, people are afraid that, oh my God, you'll smuggle plastic guns into an airport and commit assassination. You don't need a 3D printer to do that. But I'll, I'll agree with you that you can make one, which is why I think the prohibition should be on the end product. That is, a prohibition should be on actually printing and possessing it. Um, I think if a state wanted to, they could have a law that works something like this. They say, if you want to manufacture your own firearm, you just go through a background check, and we'll give you a serial number. Some states have regimes in that effect. I think under Heller, that would probably be OK. I mean, I'm not crazy about it, but I think that would probably work under Heller. Uh, New Jersey said, to make your own gun at home, you need to have a <laughs> license. You need to be a manufacturer. I think that goes too far. We have a very long tradition in this country of making your guns at home. Under federal law, you can make it. You can't sell it. Don't try and sell it. Commerce, right? You can't do that. But you can make your own gun at home. So the prohibition must be on the end result, um, not on the actual sharing and possession of the information. Uh, I can give you Supreme Court case after Supreme Court case that explains that the creation and dissemination of information is speech, even on the internet. Um, the federal government has taken the position, at least in the Obama administration, that export control laws allows the government to limit posting files on the internet. That argument was novel, right? <laughs> Traditionally, the argument, went like, the argument went like this. If I want to send a blueprint of a nuclear submarine to China, I need the government's permission. OK, I got you. I'll go along with that. that, that that's cool. Um, but this is public speech in the public domain. It's open source. The government never used these sorts of export control laws about secret information to stifle public speech in the internet. That goes too far, right? I don't know that Congress could enact a law that's narrowly tailored enough to prohibit posting files on the internet. ACLU versus Reno, uh, 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 and, and these sorts of cases go very much in the opposite direction. Um, and, and we care very much about the direction of the Supreme Court. Uh, I think the current court will be very skeptical of any sort of content-based restriction, which is what these laws are, uh, putting, uh, putting files on the internet. Now, that's the federal aspect. Um, but I think the federal government at least has one advantage. They can regulate interstate commerce, which <coughs> under current law the internet is part of. So I think the federal government could potentially put together legislation <coughs> that addresses this, although I'm not sure what it would look like, but I'll, I'll entertain that possibility. Who can't? The states. This is where we have a huge problem. Over the summer, again, we were sued nationwide. New Jersey sought a TRO against us, ex parte. What was their argument? Their argument was this, that putting a file on a server in Texas was a common law nuisance in New Jersey. I'm sorry? That putting a file on the internet in Texas resulted in a common law nuisance in New Jersey. OK, so I also teach property in addition to common law. And that, that's not what a nuisance is. But the judge actually found it persuasive. He only held back because I was able to give him some sort of settlement offer to, to sort of limit the files. Right? I told him, judge, here's what we'll do. We will put a firewall around New Jersey. We will block all New Jersey IP addresses. I called it the Great Blue Wall because at the end of the week, all the blue, all the blue states were behind this wall. Um, this has never been done before. This is like North Korea stuff, right? Usually states do not block access to entire geographic regions. We figured it out on the fly. It was great. With Pennsylvania, New York, uh, uh, New Jersey, California, basically had the entire east and west coast behind our blue wall, right? Everyone else in the middle could access the files freely. The great in-between, as Justice Scalia would call it. Um, 
but it's problematic when a state tries to regulate the commerce of another state. So you have dormant commerce clause. Uh, you also have preemption. The argument I'm sure Marianne will love. We have Section 230 of the CDA. I knew we'd have this one, right? Uh, which I, as I read at least, uh, limits a state's ability to uh, uh, impose additional liability for certain internet content providers, right? Now, that doesn't apply to people who create the code, but part of our case also is people who republish the code. We have codeisfreespeech.com. They publish this information. And as we read Section 230, uh, states can impose liability uh, 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 for those who post these files and republish them. Okay. Um, so I, I think the federal government could potentially have a narrowly tailored statute to go after this, although I don't know what it would look like. I'm very skeptical that you could pass scrutiny. Um, I don't think the states can. Um, now, what happens next, right? Well, unfortunately, this involves guns. If this was any other free speech case, I'd win 9-0, right? Imagine that Georgia back in the day passed a statute saying it's a crime to have files of 3D print sex toys, right? Just imagine, right? Imagine 3D printers exist in the 80s when Bowers was good law. And they said, it is now a crime to share information, information about a 3D print sex toys. Oh, that'd be a 9-0 case today, right? Every group, the ACLU, would be on our side, right? How can you ban sex toys? Well, George says, it's immoral, right? This, this harms, okay, those are not good cases anymore, but just presume Bowers is still good law. But this is guns, and unfortunately with guns, people uh, uh, sometimes uh, move around a bit. Um, and especially when you have these, oh my god, these plastic guns, that, that, that you create this panic. Uh, you know, my parents don't like guns. And they, they saw me, they said, Josh, what are you doing? You're on, I saw you in the PBS News Hour. What are you doing defending this gun guy? I'm like, it's okay, mom, we're, we're good. But people have this irrational fear of guns sometimes. And I think that clouds what's a serious First Amendment issue. Because if New Jersey can put these limits on free speech in this context, then there's a lot of other contexts that fall as well. Now, people may want that, right? I realize people in this room may be okay with gray restrictions on free speech. Fine, I'm not. Uh, so I take this case as seriously as I do precisely because I care about the First Amendment. Um, this isn't primarily a gun issue for me, although I think guns are important. This is primarily a free speech issue where the state cannot issue a directive to a U.S. citizen to take down a file from the Internet that's in the public domain. Thank you all so much. I look forward to your questions. It's a good segue to your areas of expertise, Marianne. <laughs> I set Mariam up. <laughs> this is the show we always do. This is good. Uh, so, because I also want to talk about fear, because you mentioned a lot about fear and panic and guns, and I love all those things. And the, <laughs> the main focus of what I want to talk about is how the irony of so much of the Second Amendment debate, or the irony of so much of the discourse on guns, is that it's very often focused on protectiveness, this idea of strength, that we need to have guns. I think as Greg was saying, we need to protect ourselves. There's an autonomy kind of idea, and that really does dominate the way that people talk about guns. And what I want to emphasize is how much of that, for all of its talk about strength and all of its talk about defense and all of its talk about autonomy, I think the gun debate is really driven by fear. And I don't mean fear of guns. I mean the fear that drives people to need guns in such a very visceral and complicated and all-consuming, I would suggest, way so that they not only need them in the sense of getting the courts to recognize certain rights within the home, but now we need them everywhere. We need to have them everywhere. We need to have them in our schools. We need to have them in our grocery stores. We need to have them in our public parks. And that that is actually driven not by a sense of strength, but by very much a sense of particular fragility. So the title of my piece, or the working title for my piece, which no one knows because I didn't submit it, but um, the, so the title of the piece is, it's a secret. Um, <laughs> is the Second Amendment safe space. And the subtitle, because I like subtitles, is the constitutionalization of fragility. OK, so that gives you a little bit of idea of where I'm going. But the idea of the safe space, everyone in this room, no doubt, has become familiar with the way that term has generally been used and become very popular in the last couple of years. Now, it's been around for a long time, 1960s or 70s, and there's some debate about whether or not it was mostly used by feminists who were talking about places where they could raise feminist ideals without being shot down, or whether it was primarily the use by, for instance, um, LGBT individuals <laughs> who could congregate in spaces where they would not be overtly discriminated against or harassed. In any event, the common use of the reason why we talk about it the way we do today is in the context of the so-called sort of snowflakery that we are all now um, subjected to, especially on the part of people like you sitting in the room, college students, university students, et cetera. Because apparently there is a crisis on America's campuses and all of our students are coddled and they're weak and they're afraid of everything. And this has become quite a theme that has become uh, popular among not even just conservative circles, but it's really been picked up by sort of across the board um, spectrum 
And one of the pieces that probably everyone in this room knows is the, the, the piece that appeared in the Atlantic called The Coddling of the American Mind, right? Jonathan Haidt is, has been banging on this drum for some time. And uh, what's really interesting about that particular piece and how influential it was is that they really, um, the, two, the two authors really go into some detail about the characteristics they think about the safe space movement, the kind of fragility of students today or kids today. And some of the things they mention, I think, are particularly relevant. So they mention, for instance, that they think that safe spaces are infantilizing. It's the idea that you're trying to make the classroom into something where no one can scare you, no one can disturb you, no one can get under your skin. And they mentioned there's a few characteristics that kind of come along with that, um, in particular logical fallacies, as they say, that really drive this sense of um, fragility, this culture of fragility. And one of them is emotional reasoning. And the idea of emotional reasoning is, I feel something strongly, therefore it must be true. Right? So I feel something, I feel nervous, I feel scared, I don't like something, therefore it must be true, regardless of whether or not I have objective evidence to show me this. OK, that's one. And the other that I think is really relevant that they point out in that piece is catastrophic thinking. The idea that everything is terrible, and that you're under attack all times, and terrible, terrible things are going to happen to you no matter where you go. And they mention that all of these things kind of feed into something else that they say, which is really destructive in particular, they think, for academic discourse, which is that all of that makes you, um, in some ways, very vindictive towards other people <coughs> who don't agree with you. Because you are so scared, and because you believe your feelings are facts, and because you believe that the worst things are going to happen, you have to suspect everyone around you who doesn't agree with you is wrong and needs to be silenced. So you get this kind of vindictiveness. Now, actually, they call it in this piece, they call it vindictive protectiveness. So what I want to submit is this conversation that we've all been subjected to for the last few years over safe spaces and the fact that students are just unable today to be resilient and tough in the ways that I guess Jonathan Haidt was when he was a young man, um, that what we're getting there, that sense of, of that sense of fragility is actually completely inaccurate. And I've written about this um, previously in my work. I have a book called The Cult of the Constitution, and I go through the fact that the college free speech crisis is mostly made up, um, and that this kind of characterization and this kind of epidemic that we're supposed to believe is sweeping college campuses simply isn't true. And it often comes you know, based on anecdotes by people who don't teach, for one. But also, um, there's a tendency not to verify whether or not the crisis that's being articulated actually has some basis in fact, and tends to ignore things, for instance, like a president who might say that flag burning should be punishable by stripping somebody of citizenship or being put in jail, that that might be more of a sense of chilling speech and maybe a more of a concern about whether or not we are entertaining different kinds of ideas. Or, for instance, the fact that something actually exists in the world called the professor watch list, which exists solely for the purpose of reporting on left-wing professors and their ideas, and to shame them and humiliate them, hopefully get them fired. If we were going to be concerned about academic freedom, if we were going to be concerned about the state of the First Amendment, it seems like there's a lot more that we could be focused on. But what I do think is interesting about the safe space caricature is that it is describing something incredibly accurately. It's not college students, though. What it's actually accurately describing is Second Amendment fetishes. In other words, we think about what that all means, right? The idea that your worldview is dominated by fear, right? When you say, I need to be protected, or I need to be able to protect myself in my own home, I need to be able to protect myself on the street, I need to be able to protect myself at Wegmans, what you're really saying is I'm scared all the time of everyone and everything. And to the extent that other people are not as scared as I am and do not want to engage in the same types of measures that I wish to take to attend to that sense of fear, they're all wrong. And they're not just wrong in the sense of I disagree with them, they have to agree with me because I'm going to bring my gun into these spaces, whether they like it or not. And as an objective matter, as opposed to, let's say, insisting on certain types of terminology in the classroom, which actually doesn't really hurt anyone, the fact that someone brings a gun into a space where other people don't want it does objectively put those people at risk. When we talk about vindictive protectiveness, and you get the Jonathan Haidt sort of, and Judy Shulovitz, and the whole line of people who say, we really need to be worried about safe spaces, one of the other things we're told is, we have to care about this because these students don't understand that they're actually doing themselves no favors. They're not safer, they're actually making themselves very vulnerable. And I would suggest that the same lesson is actually true here. It isn't just that the people who are insisting on the fact that they need guns everywhere are forcing everyone around them to comport with that same idea, they're also not making themselves any more safe. And this is something, of course, that we can talk about in terms of the empirical reality 
that the idea that guns are gonna keep you safe is not the same thing as it actually being true. So here we have a beautiful example of emotional reasoning. The idea that a gun makes me feel safer is used as evidence for the fact that guns do make me safer when they objectively do not. And they don't make anyone safer. They don't make schools safer. They don't make stores safer. And what they also don't do is make it easier for us to anticipate at any point before someone actually opens fire whether or not someone is a suspicious person that might be apprehended. We want to talk about, first of all, the chilling effects that the Second Amendment might have on the First. We've, we've talked a little bit about that. But it also has some pretty interesting effects for the Fourth Amendment. That is to say, what is a suspicious person in a place where open carry is allowed? Someone walking through a store with a gun, is that a threat? Or is that someone who's an activist? So in other words, if we're really concerned, and we should be concerned about the idea of any idea or any person's fear, any group identity that is tied to a threat, a feeling that I'm afraid of something and you all need to be afraid too, and to the extent that you're not afraid of the thing I'm afraid of, you're all wrong, and I'm going to take measures that you don't even understand are protecting you but are actually going to make you less safe, and you all need to be okay with that. So I want to suggest that that really is what's happening in the Second Amendment fetishization, right? So it's not just doctrinal. It isn't just that you get cases that say, and quite limited so far, in terms of where you can have a gun and why. They're really pretty limited, right? Heller telling us that there's the right to protect yourself within your own home. That's what the right to bear arms is about. But what we see, of course, in the case of the Second Amendment, very often the same thing with the first, is it's not just a question of the doctrine. It's not just the question of the actual constitutional theory. It's actually the popular constitutional ideas, right? What does the average person think? Because whether or not the Supreme Court ever tells you that you're allowed to carry a gun into a school, the fact that someone carries a gun to the school is still something we all have to contend with. It is not the kind of thing any of us can simply ignore and just say, well, I'm not myself going to be making that kind of choice, so I don't have to worry about someone else's choice. I'm not sure if the Supreme Court actually supports that as an interpretation of the Second Amendment. It doesn't matter. And if that gun should be used in a mass shooting, it won't matter to anybody who happens to die in that shooting whether or not this was something that was supported by jurisprudence. So what we're left with is a real culture, and it really has become a culture and an identity around guns that is essentially telling the rest of the world, you have to accommodate me. You have to accommodate the fact that I'm afraid all the time. And you have to accommodate the fact that my fear is objectively going to make you more um, unsafe. So how do we get there, right? What's odd about this, of course, is that the Second Amendment the fact that people have a preference for the Second Amendment isn't by itself a bad thing. People have preferences about which rights they like. There's very few of us who are out there advocating for the Third Amendment. It's fine. But the fact that we have preferences doesn't mean that we can nonetheless maintain constitutional legitimacy and be able to use that kind of appropriation if the kind of advocacy we are doing is so highly selective that it actually undermines other rights, First Amendment rights being one of those, but more general rights too let's say, life, liberty, pursuit of the happiness, all those kinds of things, which guns are, um, in many ways do. It isn't a problem to be selective, in other words, about the constitutional rights we care about most. That's fine. The problem is whether or not we become so selective about those rights that we don't care about the havoc that they wreak on the entire constitutional ecosystem, or the entire reason for us to have a constitution to begin with, which, at least in one narrow sense we could say, is to keep us from falling into anarchy. Right? The idea has to be on some level, we can't just be that suspicious of each other all the time that we might shoot somebody's head off. It's supposed to be some product of civilization that we've gotten out of that, right? <clears throat> the Constitution is meant to be the idea that we would have a law in place as opposed to just blowing each other's heads off all the time because we're nervous about what they're doing or because they stole our acorns or whatever it is. So we can say that we have a problem. We can say that in, the, in my book I call it constitutional fundamentalism. We have a problem when we want to take one right and elevate it over all the others such that the kind of destructiveness or the kind of impact it has on those rights is actually something that other people are going to have to contend with. That's a problem. But I suggest that even more than the problem of selectiveness about which rights we tend to put all of our emphasis on and the irony that we might be going to the mat for gun rights and not care at all, let's say, about reproductive rights or voting rights, right? But that we would also care very selectively about who it is who gets these rights. Because, presumably, right, the argument behind constitutionalization to say, let's turn this into you know, a federal case, is to say that these constitutional principles are supposed to protect all of us, right? That's the promise of the 14th Amendment, but it's also just a general logical principle one would hope. That if you are advocating for a right that really belongs just to one group and everybody else is harmed by it, then you're not really arguing anything about a principle. You're arguing for a preference. Right? That's our test, right? The easiest test in the world to figure out whether or not we're actually principled is to ask whether or not we think this is a right or a privilege that is being applied equally. 
And if we look at Second Amendment advocacy, we see that that's simply not the case. To the extent that Second Amendment activists really do claim that they want to make sure that everybody can defend themselves, we have to ask ourselves why they take the cases that they do. That is to say, who are they advocating for? Why is it that the Second Amendment becomes an issue when somebody wants to have permitless carry, for instance? Why is it an issue when somebody wants to be able to engage in an open carry demonstration as opposed to if we thought objectively, if we took a snapshot of American society and said, who is it actually who's being denied the right to defend themselves? Who is it actually that struggles to be able to enact that right without getting, I don't know, shot by a cop, right? If we actually ask that question, we obviously know what the answers are, right? There are plenty of groups that we could say are not actually getting to enhance their Second Amendment rights. African American men who happen to be carrying a weapon, or heaven forbid, not even carrying a weapon, but might look like they're carrying a weapon to someone who is determined to see one, how much are they actually able to protect their own Second Amendment rights? How much are we going to make Philando Castile, for instance, into an issue? A man who is telling a police officer, I have a permit for this weapon that I have in the car, and gets shot for that. And it's not just a question of him getting shot for that, but it's the reaction on the part of the gun lobby, which is essentially silence. If that were the kind of issue that the Second Amendment fetishists, I'm going to say, um, really cared about, that should have been a flashpoint. Or another flashpoint would have been when Marissa Alexander in Florida fires warning shots against her estranged and violent ex-husband when he's trying to kill her or threatening to kill her. And yet, silence again from the people who brought you stand your ground, right? So what we're also seeing in the play out just in terms of the doctrine, just in terms of what kinds of cases actually make people into Second Amendment activists is a very selective idea about who it is that we need to be protecting. We wanted to really talk about the fact that some people are having a hard time defending themselves or having their rights vindicated in court. We really ought to start with men of color and domestic violence victims, and yet, no. If you look at the entire history, right, of the National Rifle Association pushing through stand your ground laws in every state, what they say not only is we need to have more gun use, right? We need to be able to empower people preemptively more to be able to use deadly force. But when asked about whether or not that should apply to domestic violence victims being beaten in their own homes, they say no. Marion Hammer literally said no. In an interview about Stand Your Ground in about Florida in 2005, she was asked about whether or not she wanted to empower people to be able to defend themselves in their own homes against cohabitants. She said, of course not. Of course not. So we have a problem when we're using the Constitution selectively to undermine other people's rights and to select out a certain group of people that gets to use their rights at the expense of everybody else's. Because unlike other kinds of rights, who holds a gun actually is going to impact everything else, right? It is actually true on some level, despite the fact that you have any number of people within certain identity groups saying, your choices affect me, right? We've heard this a lot. So same-sex marriage is going to somehow affect my marriage, my straight marriage, or um, women getting abortions is going to affect my rights in some way. Well, actually, that's not true. That's literally not true. But when it comes to Second Amendment rights and carrying a firearm into places where people don't want them, you are, in fact, affecting other people's rights without their consent. And arguably, the reason why you're doing it is because it's what makes you feel safe, right? There was an article in the New York Times by Judy Shulovitz that tried to mock, really, this idea of safe spaces by talking about how, oh, the, the people in the safe space, when there was a conversation about rape culture going on, have got things like toys and Play-Doh in there to make themselves feel better about trauma. Well, we could argue that a much more dangerous toy to have on you um, if you are worried about trauma is a gun. So, but it doesn't just stop there, right? We're now looking at the fact that there's been a kind of extraordinary move on the part of the private sphere to say, you know what? We're not bound by the Second Amendment. That should be obvious, right? The Second Amendment only applies to state um, action. So if Walmart says we don't want people to be able to carry guns here, then that should be okay, right? If Salesforce says we don't want our software to be used to sell guns, that should be okay. And in fact, you would have thought some of the same people who normally would identify with the Second Amendment would say, yeah, that's the free market at work, right? So for instance, if we look at the fact that Delta Airlines in the wake of Parkland said it was no longer going to be having its NRA discount, which a lot of people didn't know since when did Delta have an NRA discount, but they said they were going to stop using it. And the response from the Lieutenant Governor of Georgia was, well, that means Delta's not gonna get the tax breaks that we were gonna give it, right? Not even thinking, not even, not even a moment of irony to reflect on the fact that this is a private company making a private decision that is among other things, a First Amendment protected decision to say we want to dissociate ourselves with a certain program, which we are free to do, and to threaten actual state action against that. 
right? This is a sign of how dysfunctional that obsession with the Second Amendment really is. And this is a real shame, I think, because the private sphere is actually giving us a lot of ways to think through the, the deadlock that we've kind of reached when it comes to the Second Amendment. And this is paralleling in many ways um, part of what Josh had referenced before, which is Section 230 and the question of online companies. Because we're having a very similar discussion in some ways. What happens when Facebook or Twitter says, you know what, we are going to ban white supremacist content. We're just not going to let you radicalize other people online because we don't think it's a good idea. What have we now started to see? Instead of people praising that as the free market doing its thing, suddenly, oh, that's censorship. But of course it's not, right? Because these are private companies. But the same sense of everything is state action is infecting the Second Amendment as much as the First Amendment debate. And not only is that just wrong as a doctrinal matter, it's also just a shame. Because if we're convinced that the First or the Second Amendment and the doctrine that we get out of it is really good and it's working out for the best, I suppose that would be an argument for expanding it and saying, let's make everything in the world look like state action. Let's treat Walmart as if it's exactly the same as the government. Let's, feed face, uh, let's treat Facebook or Twitter as if they were state actors. The thing is, we're kind of making a mess of the First and the Second Amendment to begin with, right? And there's no reason to borrow from it. And in fact, we could be thinking about the opposite. Why not think about how this is what the robust sphere of individual liberty, as the court has called it recently, is for? Letting people innovate and come up with different ways to handle the question of people's fears, people's tendencies, people's... Um, desires. Let them think differently about this because the First and the Second Amendments don't have to constrain them. We can learn from that and maybe actually inform and get better decisions when it comes to hard areas or gray areas when we're talking about the right to free speech or the right to bear arms. So these are things that I'm worried about. And I think that if we think about there, something that happened a few weeks ago, this is where I'll close, a point at which we can ponder. Um, in the wake of the El Paso shooting, and some of you may know that in the manifesto, the El Paso shooter um, left a manifesto which uh, made reference to the founders and how the, the right that he was exercising in shooting all these people was something that he was really proud that America had. And of course, in Europe, they don't have it. Okay. And only a week later or so, a man walks into Missouri Walmart you know, with an armed rifle, and he's wearing a bulletproof vest and causes a panic, obviously, because this is barely a week since the last Walmart shooting. <clears throat> and when he's apprehended, he says, I was testing Walmart's um, respect for the Second Amendment. And that's quite a claim, right? He's 20 years old, by the way. He's 20 years old, and he's testing a private store's commitment to the Second Amendment. So if we think that it's not a big deal, right, that people misunderstand what the Second Amendment actually is for or where it's supposed to protect us or not protect us or where it's in operation. If we don't think that it's an alarming proposition that we are trying to make the entire world into a safe space for the Second Amendment, consider the fact, consider the panic, <coughs> consider the fact that law enforcement didn't know whether they should shoot this guy or talk to him, consider the implications of this. Because where we're left when we have this cultural identity around the gun, the cultural identity around fear, and the idea that the entire world needs to accommodate it, to accommodate the sense of fragility, and when disruption and harm and even death result, that the answer is going to be, I was simply testing our dedication to the Second Amendment, we should all be very worried about that kind of vindictive protectiveness. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. This has been a really uh, awesome set of presentations and opens lots of questions. Um, and we have about 10 minutes, so I'm going to ask just two quick ones and then open, uh, open to the audience. Um, and start with you, Greg. Um, it, as you're talking, um, you described sort of two main themes that have distinguished sort of your thinking here and, and with regard to the First Amendment, the public versus private and stability versus dynamism. But as I was listening to you, it sounds to me like there's actually a, two other distinctions that sort of fall into four boxes maybe that explain of kind of how you're thinking about things. And one is the distinction you draw between sort of rights and interests. And you note there's certain kinds of things we accept as rights because accepted sources of constitutional meaning, doctrine, whatever established them as definitely rights. And then there's interests, which are kind of related, like they're, they're about speech or guns, but they're not necessarily constitutionally protected. And then, of course, you distinguish speech and guns. And that gives you four boxes, where you've got speech rights and speech interests and gun rights and gun interests. And I wonder if some of the conflicts you're trying to resolve here is just by trying to figure out which boxes we're in, such that like a Walschlager is a pretty straightforward free speech rights case that should have been a very easy case, it seems to me, for the 11th Circuit and a very attenuated Second Amendment interest, if anything, right? Is that how we're going to resolve these things? Is that most of it's going to end up that it's a right versus an interest? And then secondly, if it is rights versus rights or interest versus interests, do you, and I think I know the answer to this based on things you've written, do you sort of take what, what Marianne was saying earlier, that sometimes it's okay to be selective and just run headlong into the idea, yeah, there's a hierarchy of rights and the First Amendment is above the second um, and I'm just happy to accept that. 
does that trigger the sort of second second class right argument about which you've already written? Um, and I should note, also filed a brief, uh, an excellent brief on, in the in the pending NYSERPA case. And then Josh, for you, sort of building off of that question, it seems to me on that rights interest thing that the story you tell is one of like a right with no interest behind it, like the at least no Second Amendment interest. Like as, as you're describing it, the the gun, the people who might print these guns are doing it, as I think you said, to be jerks or to protest, and you say they're not actually effective weapons, which are in, in the course of saying why they're not dangerous, so these are actually really bad weapons, which I think would also make them really ineffective for self-defense. So there's actually not really anything here other than the principle, which might be plenty. But I wonder if this case had been one where the free speech claim threatened gun owners, would you tell the same story? So imagine a hypothetical where instead of 3D printed guns, some like Cracker Jack engineer out there designs a thing which you can print on a 3D printer which disables all guns within 50 feet or something like that. And they want to distribute the code for that. Government passes a law to prevent it. Do you take that case, is it the same case or is it different? Because there you've got guns being sort of shut down as opposed to being enabled. But um, Greg, Josh, and then I'll open it up for any other questions. All right, I'll try to do this really quickly. So the answer to your second question is, is simpler for me, and it is, is yes. When we have a, a, a interest versus interest scenario, that's your basic public policy debate, and obviously we argue at that point about selectivity based on our policy preferences. More eccentrically, I have argued, and I, I continue to believe that courts should be more open uh, and more uh, courageous, perhaps, about acknowledging when rights come into conflict and working through those conflicts uh, as a, a matter of, of normative constitutional law, which is really applied political theory in the end anyway. As to your first question about whether the sort of right interest designation kind of helps us resolve this, I guess it depends on, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, who do you mean, what, what do you mean by we? If we're talking about at a level of doctrine, yeah, it's, it's very important what the Supreme Court says about the Second Amendment and what actually becomes qualified as the Second Amendment's right claim. And, and, and that development of doctrine is going to tell us a lot about how these conflicts come out. In, in, in terms of, of, of a more normative argument, and this I'd I, I love to talk to Marianne more about this, this whole sort of public-private boundary, state action boundary, um, I tend to believe in a lot of circumstances that, that I think Marianne offers some very apt qualifications to this, but that some rights are properly and desirably translated uh, as, as norms. So there are a lot of these circumstances where as a person with a particular conception of what free speech means in principle, I would like to see those principles play out even in the private sphere at the level where we're talking about interest rather than rights, and I'll leave it there. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Imagine a different law where the state passed a law saying it's a crime to 3D print tool techniques before abortions. Is that a violation of the First Amendment or the Due Process Clause? Maybe both. Uh, I view this as a hybrid case where one right reinforces the other. We're not just printing out doodads or whatever you want to do. You're printing out something which is, I think, part of the Second Amendment right. Um, but these are not the only dangerous rights. And this is one part where I disagree with Ma uh, Marianne quite a bit. Um, we have a lot of dangerous rights that inflict others. I would say the right to abortion does inflict harm. And we can disagree on that for hours and then, but that does inflict some harm. Uh, Miranda, uh, people can go free and become dangerous. Uh, rights during the criminal trial, right to due process, right to attorney, uh, 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 a right to speedy trial. These are all rights with it, which if they're not adhered to, dangerous people can go to our community. There are studies showing how Miranda's resulted in increases in crime. Uh, uh, I think it's a, a mistake to say this is the only dangerous right. We have lots of dangerous rights. Um, as for hypocrisy, we're all hypocrites, right? No one's consistent. Uh, group A favors this group. Group B favors this group. I don't think this is fetishism or limited to gun rights activists. I think this is just a nature of human uh, development. Uh, we all focus on topics we care deeply about. I like to write about one thing. You write about another. Uh, I don't think it makes us any sort of bad faith experts, but it tends to be what we tend to focus on. I think that's a question we'll ask. Why do we write about what we write about? I don't care about torts. I don't care about bankruptcy. I don't care about uh, you know some obscure topic of commercial law. You know, I like Second Amendment stuff. I like First Amendment stuff. Why? Maybe going to couch, we can explain that to a psychiatrist sometime. But this is something we all approach around. Why do we do what we do? And I think it's a. a, a I don't think it's a strike when someone say pick one side or the other. Just, just to be clear on my question, Josh, it was not, not asking, not, not accusing you of hypocrisy. It was trying to get you to, in, in this case, it sounds like a happy coincidence that your commitment to the First and Second Amendments lined up. Yeah. And I was trying to come up with a hypo that would force you to choose between them. So the hypo is, you've got a thing that actually will disable guns. Do you still, do you choose the First Amendment there, or do you go with the... Um, 
that, that's all so I was trying to get to. It's a law that it's the it, same it, thing it's except the negative that, that I'm not getting. So it's the, the, the device, rather than creating a gun, creates a device that will disable guns. The person wants to distribute the code. They're being prevented from doing it on exactly the same facts. Like, like, like a V-chip almost thing? I don't know. I don't know how it would work. I've just invented it like, on the spot here. Um, but whoever is listening, engineers can come up with that. But yeah, like a V-chip that would disable guns. Do you, do you take the cases at the same and, for and you? And Congress said you can't make Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, they can't do that. No, if, if private actors want to do this, uh, uh, they can. I'm not on the Josh Hawley camp. We need to like you know make make Facebook a public utility. I'm not, yeah. I'm not in that camp. Uh, indeed, I in my paper I talk about this. What if Comcast or, or Verizon want to create a filter that said if we intercept any packets with files that can use a 3D printed gun, we will block your packet. I don't like that, but I think I I I, I don't consider an ISP a utility. I think they could probably do it if 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 Google. Or Facebook decided they don't want to host our files. Uh, they can. I mean, indeed, uh, your your group sends lots of letters to host the company saying, "Don't host these files." Um, I don't like them. I think it's harassing. Uh, but if private entities want to use economic forces, they can. Uh, if, if Walmart wants to prohibit open carry, I, I don't have an objection to that. I, I, it's a it's a business decision. Um, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people think the Second Amendment limits Walmart. I got so many calls, Marianne. In the last two weeks, can Walmart ban guns? Like, of course they can. Of course they can ban guns. They do whatever they want. By the way, they didn't actually ban. They, they said we request not to carry. It wasn't even a ban. So it was actually mostly PR flack. Uh, uh, but look, a lot of people don't understand the Constitution. First Amendment. Oh, Facebook censoring me. No, they're not. Facebook can censor you. They're not a government actor, right? People don't understand the Constitution at all. This is not just about guns. People are generally ignorant of the Constitution, which is why I love civic education. I think it's an important attribute altogether. But thank you. Liz. Let me on that. Let me open up. I got um, Daryl and Eric, and we may go two or three minutes over, but not too long. So, uh, uh, am I going first? Yeah, go ahead. So, I, uh, and of course, this is a step back from something that you asked this question and the others used to say asinine. A version of what you were saying is the problem in development to everybody on the panel, which is what if the that is, what if, like, malware? What imagine that you had a kind of speech code, right, that we assume is protected, that uh, actually does something, I think it hijacks, uh, you know, a smart car, it turns off the life support system, uh, however well you would think it. It's not conduct, right? I mean, let's say you have to download it. There has to be some <coughs> kind of intermediate agent, right? But that's, you know, in, in the, the speech is the, is the weapon. Where where do you sort of understand that dynamic? Because it seems like that's the, the the risk that Josh has identified is the risk of you know the slippery slope in one direction. The risk of not um, sort of holding the line at this is you end up going down the, the other part of the slope. That is, somebody says that I've got a weapon that is part of this. Let's get Eric's question in too, and then respond to both so we don't go over too much. Eric, for yeah, sure. <laughs> This is a fantastic panel, and um, my question has to do, I'm not directing at anyone in particular, but it has to do with this notion of fear um, and, and how fear comes into play when we're talking about regulating the Second Amendment in the name of the First Amendment. But it seems like in between the, in, in between the, the gun carrying and the chilling of speech is subjective fear on the, on the part of the bystander whose speech is chilled. And it's that fear of the gun that is chilling the speech. So, I, it, and this is something I've thought a great deal about, I've written about it a bit, and one of the challenges that I come up with, um, that, that I face when I'm thinking about this, is how can you, can we just accept as fact that the presence of a gun, the mere presence of a gun, causes fear in other people, and secondly, that Preventing that fear is a constitutionally salient interest that can justify regulating the Second Amendment. Um, and in the background, I'm thinking that usually the regulation of fear, or, or, or regulating the name of fear, wouldn't be sufficient for First Amendment impingement, absent some imminent threat. Um, and there are other content, contexts where um, uh, fear, uh, just the mere presence of fear would give us great pause before we regulate. Um, and so, you know, I'm just wondering how you, how you deal with, with that issue. 
Let me just recommend Eric's excellent article on this, which I think appeared in Long Contemporary Problems. If I, it did, yeah. Right. yeah, so a couple of years ago. So. Well done, LNCP. I think. Um, I got to I got to take that because it's really interesting. So I want to push back on part of what you're saying and really embrace another part of it. The, the, the part that I push back on a bit is that there's sort of a direct parallel between these two conceptions of fear, and I think there's a very important difference. The the notion of chilling of speech uh, presumes or posits that there is a consequence of fear that is socially undesirable. That is, that speech that would otherwise benefit society doesn't happen. Um, I don't see the same sort of position or premise uh, available in sort of qualifying or, or, or promoting the notion that, that the, 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 the fear that gives rise to uh, guns and self-defense should, should be something that we care about. The, the part of what you're asking, though, that I think is really, that I, I want to embrace, I think you're, you're right about, you asked, should we assume that this fear actually has this consequence? And you're quite right. It's an empirical question. This is something that First Amendment law has never dealt with, and constitutional law has never dealt with terribly well. The, the notion of uh, the, the, the the second part of that last thing you asked, you know, is it a matter of constitutional moment that, that speech is chilled? Yeah. I mean, doctrine has established that very well. What First Amendment law hasn't established and what social science may have done a better job of establishing, I should probably know better than I do, is just this question of how exactly does the chilling of speech work? I mean, in doctrine, it's always just assumed. Yes, people will have this fear and they will not speak. So my kind of position is assuming that's true, then yeah, that's a constitutionally valid interest and it's a really socially important problem and loss. But the empirics are heavily underdeveloped and we would benefit a great deal from knowing more about how the chilling of speech actually works. I, I guess partly in response to both of those things, I think that so much of what is interesting about the Second Amendment debate is how much it reveals the dysfunction of the First Amendment debate, right? That is to say, the First Amendment is a mess. And, and the, the debates over exactly these questions about harmful, you know, in some ways harmful speech, right? That's, that's one version of the question. And the question of how much we can quantify that fear we haven't done a good job of this in the First Amendment. We've, we've, we've rested on this kind of formalism that says, well, you know, if it's not directly causing harm at this moment or almost exactly the moment of harm, then we're just not going to count it, right? And that completely discounts the fact that, of course, it's possible for speech to, in fact, silence other people. Speech can silence. Speech can harm people by the infliction of speech itself. There doesn't have to be a second or third thing to happen. That's possible. But the courts have mostly ignored that. I say mostly because that isn't to say, I mean, I'm right here with Fred Shower on this, to say they, they ignore it, literally ignore it, by saying there's all kinds of speech that we just preemptively regulate and don't even call it a First Amendment issue, right? The fact that we have, um, you know, lawyer-client confidentiality or perjury laws or securities regulation, all these things regulate speech all the time, but people don't generally talk about them that way. And so there's a huge question, first of all, about what we even count as speech. Um, I'm going to make a very unpopular sort of appeal to saying we need to talk about the Spence test more, right, so, which nobody ever wants to do. So the Spence test, some of you may know that we used to care a little bit about whether or not speech was protected, even if we have accomplished the speech conduct analysis, which we've also forgotten how to do because the Internet. So, so the speech conduct problem, the O'Brien questions, all the rest of it, we're, we've acted as if they're resolved. That's a problem. But even if we've decided that something is speech and not conduct, or it's expressive enough conduct to count as speech, we've abandoned any attempt to try to say, does that mean everything? And the Spence test, as, as, as poorly it maybe as it did, it tried to do that to say, look, you can't just count something as speech because it doesn't seem like anything else. It has to be that there's some kind of message that a reasonable person would be able to understand, right? So what is the, the message that's being sent by certain types of controversial speech? I think if we ask that question a bit more, we'd get a better analysis of what we're actually trying to do when we decide what is protected by the First Amendment and what is not. And the first thing that we'd have to say about the First Amendment to get to a moment of honesty is to stop telling ourselves that we have this absolutist protection to it that we never, ever um, interrupt except for these sacred categories that have always been around because, frankly, those categories haven't always been around. They're some of the stupidest reasons to not protect speech, right? Obscenity is a dumb category. We should give up on that one, put something else in its place if we're only going to have five. But also to think about the fact that, you know, if we think about the historically, traditionally unprotected forms of speech, well, then we've got a child pornography problem because that's the 1980s when the courts figure out that there's some kind of analysis we're doing there that doesn't fit into anything else, but somehow we've determined that kind of speech is too harmful, even though literally it doesn't harm anyone, right? The reproduction of the image as opposed to the creation of the imagery. So I think we're, we're, what both of your questions are pointing to is we need a radical reaccounting of First Amendment doctrine, get clear on some of these issues about the distinctions between speech and conduct, and to clarify the fact that we don't protect all forms of speech, we only protect certain forms that actually have a real message, and then we'd actually get some, I think, some um, clarification when it comes to the intersection of the First and the Second Amendment.
Uh, Daryl, you ask a very good question. Um, and that was a subject of the first paper I wrote, right? When is data speed? Um, this comes up in the antitrust context, right? Uh, FTC wants to really look at search results. Google says, no, we're speed, right? And I think at what point does code become unprotected, I think is a tough but important question. Uh, where I begin to draw the line is how much uh, human interaction is actually required. It's something completely autonomous, right? I just push a button and a gun pops out. And like, same way you go to 7 Eleven, you push a button and a thing of coffee comes out, right? That sort of machine code that executes people code, I think, may not be protected. And I, I've made this point publicly. Uh, but the sort of code we have here is a lot easier. It's visual, it's graphical, you can see it, you can represent it, you can modify it, you can tweak it, you can do lots of things to it. So that's why I said it's possible to draft a law where certain types of code could be regulated, but the sort of code at issue in our case is not there. It's very expressive, it's well within the bounds of Brown versus EMA and other cases like that of what could be protected. Please join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And uh, my apologies.